So now at this point, normally in the service, we have a little preview of what we're going to be looking at in the sermon. And we do that with the kids who are going to head to Sunday school. And there are a small number of children this morning heading to Sunday school. So, uh, so for the rest of you, you're going to get to hear this twice. But what I want you to do is I want to sp- you to speak to the person or person sat next to you, or maybe turn behind you. Or if you don't really want to do that, you can just think in your own head. And I want you to answer this question which is, what makes for a good husband or wife? Okay, you might be married this morning and you can think of this really easily because you can think of your own husband or wife and you can just list off their characteristics. It might be that you're single this morning and you would love to be married perhaps. What is it that you want to look for in a husband or a wife? Have a think for a moment. Maybe you can talk to the person next to you and then I'll get us back together in a second. Okay, now with much trepidation, I'm going to ask you what you said to each other. So please, does someone want to tell me what makes for a good husband or a good wife? Alvina, please. Separate houses. Okay, there you go. It wasn't as bad as some of the things I thought you might say, so there you go. (laughs) Anybody else? Yes, at the back, sorry. Brilliant. Someone who loves God, yeah? That might be almost identical to the answer that we're going to look at in a moment. Jennifer, what were you going to say? Yes, one that you can communicate with, a loving husband who you can communicate with. Kyla. What did you say? A gentleman. Yes, someone who's polite. Yes. Yeah, good luck. Um, (laughs) Finding someone like that. Right, what I want you to do is turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, which is the chapter that we're looking at together today ephesians chapter 5 it's on page 1176 if you've got a church bible um if you don't have a church bible you can either get one grabbed for you from the back does anyone else need a bible yes louise would like a bible there you go and one here great Thanks, Lola. Brilliant. Ephesians chapter 5, page 1176. And look at verse 22 and at verse 25. And here, I want you to notice the word as, okay? As, A-S, as. Wives, and it's going to come up on the screen as well. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now listen, of all the things that we might list that we might want to look for in a husband or a wife, Ephesians 5 tells us that we should look for someone who loves Jesus and also loves like Jesus. Yeah? In a husband or wife, this is what you're looking for before anything else. Someone who loves Jesus and who loves like Jesus. So here we get it, don't we? Husband, wives, submit, to your, uh, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. They love the Lord. And husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. They are to love their wives just in the same way as Christ loved the church, which is how? By giving himself up for her. Well, we're going to look in some more detail um, in the sermon at those verses. But for now, you're looking for someone who loves Jesus and loves like Jesus. Let's pray and ask the Lord to provide those people for us if we're not yet married, to help us to be like that if we are married, and to be with us as we look at God's word together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to ask uh, 
that you would help us to love Jesus and love others like Jesus loves. We want to pray that you would forgive us that we don't do that. And we ask that you might help us more and more to love like Jesus. And we pray, please, that that might be the priority in our relationships too. Husbands and wives, single people in the church, those who would love to be married, that we might look for someone who loves Jesus and loves like Jesus. We pray now as the children leave for Sunday school and as we look at your word together, we ask for your help and for your blessing in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So, okay, if you want to um, find your Bibles again and turn to Ephesians chapter five, uh, we're going to read from verse 21 down to verse 33 and Neva's going to come and read for us so you can follow along as Neva reads for us. Ephesians chapter five, verse 21. Thanks, Neva. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, 21. Um, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Amen. Thanks so much, Neva. So if you're uh, new here or you're visiting, let me explain that we uh, basically what we've been doing is working our way through this book of Ephesians in the New Testament, looking at the verses and seeing what they mean and how they apply. And we have come this morning to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to 33. And I am convinced that this morning is going to raise a number of questions for almost all of us. And so I want to invite you to ask me questions and also to encourage you to talk to one another um, about the passage afterwards. This is actually our second look at these verses. If you weren't here a few weeks ago, we looked at these verses to see what Paul's definition of marriage is. And if you haven't seen that, I suggest that you pick that up uh, from YouTube and have a listen uh, later in the week. But this week we're going to zoom in, having defined marriage, we're going to zoom in and just have a look at what this passage says to wives and to husbands. Don't worry if you're not a wife or a husband this morning, because I think the passage has some things to say to you as well, also by implication. Before we get into the detail of all of that, though, I want to show you what I think essentially is a glorious contradiction in the Bible. Not a, not a contradiction in itself, not that the Bible contradicts itself, I don't think the Bible does that. It's rather a contradiction between uh, reality as the Bible sees it and reality as the world presents it. This contradiction between what the Bible says about life and what it's to be lived for and what our world says life is to be lived for. And I'd like to show you that by getting you to turn up a few passages. And so please do grab a Bible and turn with me to these. There are only two of them. They're quite simple, and it's going to be really helpful for you if you can see them in black and white in front of you. Uh, Mark chapter 10 is the first place that I want us to start. So that's on page 1075, 1075. And if you are able to, please do turn uh, with me. Mark chapter 10. Now, in Mark chapter 10, James and John have been asking Jesus for the places of high honor in glory. 
I think perhaps by this point they have begun to understand that Jesus is not the warrior that they first thought he was. He's not going to ride into Jerusalem on a war horse and conquer the Romans and give them a place in Jerusalem. So they ask instead for seats of honour in glory. They want to sit on his right hand and his left. So look down at verse 37 of Mark chapter 10. Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory, they ask. Now, as you might imagine, this doesn't go down very well with the other disciples. They're a little irritated that James and John would be uh, so presumptuous that they would ask for this. So verse 41 picks up the disciples' reactions. It says, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. They were furious. How dare you put yourself ahead of others like that? Now, place yourself in Jesus' feet for a moment, okay? So, James and John have asked you for the places of honour in glory. What are you going to say to them? How are you going to placate them? How are you going to kind of uh, cover over this kind of fracture that's developing in the disciples? Maybe you're going to say to them something like this. Don't worry. There are lots of seats of glory. There's enough for everybody to have a seat of glory and glory. Don't worry about James and John. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Everyone will have a turn. That's how we do these things often, isn't it? Uh, we say that everyone will get a turn. But Jesus doesn't deal with it like that. Instead, I want you to notice that actually what Jesus does is he contradicts them about their whole view of greatness, telling them that in effect that they, they have completely misunderstood what greatness really is. Look down at verse 42. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you, he says, verse 43. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Do you see his point? This is, let me say to you, this is absolutely life-changing if you'll understand what Jesus is saying here. James and John and the rest of the disciples with them, the rulers of the Gentiles, the whole of the world, probably quite a few of us in this room this morning, think that greatness is about having a seat of honour. Literally, verse 42, we imagine that greatness is being in a position to command the obedience of others, to be able to insist on our own way. Perhaps like a, like a general in an army, or a, a head teacher in a school, or the president of a nation. You know, that's honour, so we think. That's glory. Being able to give instructions to other people that they must obey. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. That's not honour. That's not glory. Not in my kingdom. Because in the kingdom of heaven, verse 43, service is greatness. So much so that receiving instructions and obeying them, giving yourself up for others, that that's greatness, says Jesus. And so committed is he to this view of greatness that verse 44 tells you that the greatest of all of them is the one who serves all of them. The greatest in the kingdom is the one who has served everyone in the kingdom, which of course is Jesus. He's the slave of all who has given himself up because he did not come to be served, but, verse 45, to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Now, just, I don't know how your brain works, but just kind of bank that somewhere in your brain, that greatness in Jesus' mind is service, and the greatest is the one who is the servant of all. That's Mark chapter 10. And turn with me now to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians is on page 1179. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 is uh, Paul's great hymn about Christ and his work. And it's given to us not only so that we understand Christ's work and his greatness and his humility, but also verse 5, so that we will understand how to be like that ourselves. He starts in verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. In other words, uh, this, this mindset, this kind of way of thinking, this pattern of thinking that Christ has is to be your pattern of thinking, my pattern of thinking as I relate to others in the life of the church. And what is that Christ-like mindset? Well, verse 6, 
Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, again, let me suggest to you that these are mind-bendingly brilliant verses. If you want to learn some verses of the New Testament, learn these, because these teach you not only what Christ has done, but also what it means to live the Christian life. The Christian life is you are saved by the work of Christ, and now the Christian life is to live in the way that Christ lived, not in our own efforts and energies, but with the mindset that God has given us. And notice what this is. Jesus leaves the glory of heaven in submission to the Father's will. He obeys all the way to the cross, taking, verse 7, the nature of a servant. Now, Christians sometimes mess up here. They assume that because the eternal Son did this, he, he is making himself, in some sense, less than God when he does it. You know, perhaps he is as much God as it was possible for a man in his position to be, but he was less than God himself. That's wrong. That's not right. You'll see in verse 6 that it insists that even as a man, he is still in very nature God, with equality with God. But more than just that, and more incredible than that, you are told, aren't you, in verse 9, that it is the very act of humble obedience, which means the Father gives him the name at which every knee should bow. Do you notice that? It's as if, it's as if God the Father looks on the humble submission of the son and sees him humbling himself to death on the cross looks at that and says that's glory that's glory i will give him the name above every name at which every knee must bow in other words you and i will bow at the feet of jesus in eternity not because his power was wielded with a great stick but because he humbled himself on a cross surrendered as a dying servant his humility is his glory his humility is his glory now gather up all of that if you can for a moment greatness is service and jesus glory is his humility and come back to ephesians it's literally just turning one page back in your bible to ephesians chapter 5. ephesians chapter 5 verses 21 and 22 and hopefully you can see here that when Paul is asking the church to be marked by mutual submission to one another, and when he specifically zooms in on wives, asking them to submit to their own husbands, he is not for a moment suggesting that women are less important than men. He is not for a moment suggesting that men are cleverer than women or that men are more capable than women. All of that really is just reading our own misunderstandings of greatness and significance into these verses. Instead, in the context of the New Testament, where greatness is service and Christ glory is his humility, what Paul is asking church members and specifically wives in this passage to do is to be gloriously Christ-like, which is the very same thing that he demands of husbands in verse 25 when he says that they should give themselves up for their wives like Christ did for the church. Let me try and say something really carefully this morning as we set out. I, I don't really know how offended you are by these verses or otherwise, but I, I think that often the offense that is taken at these verses and the controversy that they have in the life of the church is nothing really to do with a heightened view of equality and dignity that we seem to have. It's not that at all. Actually, do you know what? We didn't invent human dignity. Yeah, you know that, don't you? God invented human dignity when he made us. It's as old as creation itself. Rather, the offense of these verses is because I think both as men and women, we have a primitive, unbiblical idea of greatness. We assume, don't we, like James and John in Mark 10, that submission and giving oneself up for another cannot be the road to Christ-like exaltation. But as we've seen in Mark 10 and Philippians 2, it is. It is. 
which means in the context of the Bible, this passage is offering to husbands and to wives glory and greatness even. Not by insisting on their own way, but by being willing to give it up for another. And if you're not married this morning, this is the picture that you are to see in the marriages in church. And this is what you're to look like, look for in a potential husband or wife. You are to look for Christ-like, humble glory. Now, that is a really long introduction, isn't it? But let's come and have a look at the passage in a bit more detail with two very simple headings. What does it mean to be a wife and what does it mean to be a husband? Okay, let's do uh, wives first, verses 22 to 24. Verse 22, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, you'll notice, won't you, that her Christ-like humility, the wife is to her husband like the church is to Christ. Again, this is because the real drama of human relationships is the picture that he is painting of God's saving work in Christ. And we're going to look at that more in a bit, uh, a bit of time later. And notice the two qualifiers of the wife's submission here. Notice one, that it is submission to her own husband. You notice that? This is not women submit to men. This is not even wives submit to husbands. Rather, this is wives submitting to their own husband in Christian marriage. It means, doesn't it, that Paul is not talking about society or work. He's not suggesting that women shouldn't hold high office in government or in business. Rather, he's talking about Christian marriage because of its particular place in the world, pointing to Christ and the church. Again, we'll see more of that in a moment. But the second qualifier that we are given here is in verse 24, when Paul says that the wife is to submit to her husband in everything. In other words, this dynamic of submission and headship is not reserved just for special occasions or for big decisions, but it is a more of a posture and mode of operating that within the mutual submission of the whole church, verse 21, wives are to submit to their own husbands with Christ-like humility in everything, just as the church does to Christ. Now, interestingly, and maybe frustratingly for those of us who like to be given a clear to-do list, Paul doesn't then work it out with a list of in-practice case studies for what you should and shouldn't do. But that, I think, is deliberate because Paul is not working at that level. Instead, he is talking about motivation and desire, about how we see our position and how we understand what our role is and what it's for. So just like all of us inside the mutual submission of the local church see our role as encouraging others, giving ourselves up for others, following the lead of the leaders in the church, so the wife to her husband in marriage. Her desire is to be like the Christ-transformed church, graciously submitting to her husband and helping him. Not because she doesn't have or shouldn't have opinions of her own, not in any sense because she is worth less than her husband or even less capable, but because in the eyes of God it is a glorious thing to be a submissive wife to a loving, self-giving husband. Just like it's glorious to be the church, the bride of the self-giving, loving Christ. Now, I know all of this is extraordinary, isn't it, today? I know this passage has been widely misused by abusive and controlling, lazy husbands. And that's not just in the past, that still happens today, doesn't it? But that doesn't mean that we should ignore what Paul is saying here. Instead, we need to see that Paul's assumption is that just as a man is not a woman, so a wife is not a husband. And that that difference means something about the marriage relationship. Because the marriage relationship is saying something about God and who he is and what he is doing in the world and not just something about the two people involved. C.S. Lewis, who was an academic at Oxford in the last century, wrote this about uh, the relationship between husbands and wives and men and women. He says, the imagery describing Christ and the church, we're dealing with male and female, not merely as facts of nature, but as the life and all-filled shadow of reality utterly beyond our control and largely beyond our knowledge. See what he's saying? Actually, this, this idea of there being a way for husbands and wives to relate to one another is because in God's economy it is pointing to Christ and the church and what they're doing. And that is unfathomable to us in its great reality. 
And that's the sense in verses 31 and 32 in our passage. Verse 31, if you look down, is, is a quote from Genesis chapter 2. Moses, who writes the book of Genesis, uh, breaks from the creation narrative when Eve has been made. If you like to preach a mini sermon on marriage there in Genesis 2, and what he says is this, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. That's, that's what Moses is saying is the implication of Eve being made for Adam. And then Paul writes this, verse 32, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Now notice carefully what's being said here. There's nothing in this passage that says that the husband uh, should go out to work and the wife should stay at home looking after the children. That's, that's not what it's saying, is it? I actually think that is a rather recent development when you think about when these words were written. If you look at the Old Testament, if you look at the, the wife of Proverbs 31 or any of the women in the Old Testament, you realize that they are not really a 1950s stereotype of a woman or a wife. In fact, actually, when you look at verse 31, it's saying really the opposite of what you expect it to say. Notice, look, the man leaves and joins his wife. It's not the wife leaving and joining her husband. And that seems to be, doesn't it, because the woman here is the creator of the family. And so the man leaving the family of his father and mother goes to his wife and through unity with her makes another family unit. And so, says Paul, Christian wives are to embrace the dignity and glory that's given to Eve which is seen in the church and submit to her own husband as to the Lord and thereby become a picture of the church, the church which is the bride of Christ, the church which is the family of Christ, the church which is the place for Christ to dwell, the church which is uh, the, the one for whom Christ left his father in heaven to come and save and rescue. Now let's just try and land some of those ideas for a moment. Let me ask you a dangerous and a difficult question if you're a wife in the room, let me ask you, how are you getting on with this? How might this change how you relate to your husband? How might it challenge how you see that particular difficulty that you have? Are there some areas in which you need to get a close friend to pray for you in? Perhaps you've thought that the best route to glory and joy in your marriage is by insisting on your own way or by trying to develop some sort of system for fairness whereby you get your own way some of the time and he gets his own way some of the time. Now, I know this is difficult and your husband is doubtless a failure, just like me, but Paul still says, for your glory and for your joy, submit to your own husband. And if you're single this morning, and perhaps maybe you would love to be married, maybe you wouldn't, but perhaps you would, there are some helpful things for you here. I think there are at least three helpful things for you to see here. One, this is a reminder for you that marriage is tough in the same way as sanctification is tough, right? Growing as a Christian is tough. Don't, don't idolize marriage as being bliss. It's, it's hard, it's difficult, it's tough. It involves sanctification, becoming more like Christ. The second thing it means is that in looking for a marriage partner, you are looking for someone that you are able to submit to. It means that you must be looking for a Christian man and a Christian man who is going in a direction that you want to follow. Don't, don't submit to someone who is going to drag you in a direction that you don't want to go. And the third thing it means, I think, is that the best training place, the best place to learn how to be married is verse 21 in the mutual submission of the life of the church. It turns out that it is the life of the local church that is the best training ground for being a godly wife, not the romantic soppiness of our culture. So what does it mean to be a wife? There you go, we've done that. What does it mean to be a husband? Verse 25 to 30. Interestingly here, husbands are given much more airtime. While the instructions to them are different, they are told too to be humble and Christ-like. The husband is not to demand submission and respect from his wife, rather he is to woo her to it by his giving himself up for her. If anything, it is a, a higher and lower calling at the same time, to lower themselves even lower, just as Christ gives himself up for the church. So verse 25, husbands love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, 
cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. It's worth noting here, isn't it, that Paul's dominant concern for the husbands is not, it turns out, their leadership in the home or in the workplace, or even in the life choices that he takes with his wife. Rather, his concern is for the spiritual leadership of the home. In other words, his concern is that the husband is to, to give himself up as the sacrificial servant leader, pursuing godliness and Christ-likeness. I think this is a super challenge to us husbands in the room. You know, don't you, if you're, a, if you're a husband this morning, you know, don't you, that when you meet the Lord, he will not so much be interested in your career achievements or even in the educational achievements of your children, but he will be really, really interested in the godliness of your wife because that's your responsibility that he's given you here. How have you led her sacrificially, giving yourself up for her? into growth and flourishing. I know this is tough because for many husbands, they love the idea of taking the lead everywhere but spiritually. Let me say that the, the emphasis of the passage seems to suggest to me that if you're not leading your wife into Christian growth, you have no right to lead her in any other area. Husband's headship in the home starts with an open Bible, not a career plan, not a food preference, not a colour on the walls preference, but an open Bible. We're following the Lord. Let's go this way. Let's go together. In verse 28, Paul points out that this kind of sacrificial concern for our wives is good for us too. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. There's a beautiful irony here, isn't there, for the husband who is self-interested. You know, the, the husband who is insisting on his own way all the time, who is grumpy and demanding and disinterested in the spiritual well-being of his family. That man thinks that he's living the good life, but actually is hurting himself. Because like Christ and the church, the husband and the wife are so intertwined with one another that her joy and glory is yours. It's like the, the man who's eating loads of donuts, you know, drinking 10 pints of beer a night and smoking 30 cigarettes a day, thinks he's having a great time. I'm living my best life. No, you're not. You're killing yourself. Well, so with a husband who is neglectful, demanding, rude, refusing to give himself up for, neglecting to take a spiritual lead, that husband is hurting himself. So let me ask another dangerous question this morning. It's time to ask the husbands in the room, how are you doing with this high and holy calling? How is your wife doing spiritually? Are you being lazy and neglectful? Are you self-occupied and demanding? Are you more interested in who's controlling the TV remote than you are in who's coming to church with you on a Sunday? Or even how often you are here? You know, does your wife drag you to church or are you bringing the family? And single men in the church, is this the kind of leader that you desire to be? Are these the foundations that you're laying in your life? Because these are the things that a good wife will want from you. Now, of course, all of this is profoundly challenging. I know that for me, there are many, many ways I fall short of this as a husband. And let me say, if I can, as clearly as I can, I think being a husband is the hardest thing that I do. Not because Vanessa is hard to be married to. Not at all. It's because being a husband is a fight, isn't it? Not a fight with your wife. It's a fight with your sinfulness because that's what you're giving up and laying down. And it's a fight all the time. So husbands, perhaps there's a conversation that you need to go home and have. Or perhaps there are some areas where you need to ask a Christian friend to pray for you in. Perhaps there's some repenting that you need to do for areas in which you failed. Because we've all failed, haven't we? But let me end this morning, having spoken to wives and to husbands, let me end with a love story. It's Valentine's Day this week, isn't it? So let me end with a love story. This love story begins with a young woman who is down on her luck. She's living on the streets after a string of failed relationships. She's not sure where the next meal will come from or where she's even going to sleep for the night. 
But then along comes a young man. And what's striking about this young man is not so much his dashing appearance or his muscular physique. This young woman has seen men like that before. She has the scars from men like that. She's been let down by those kind of men time and again. What's striking about this young man instead is his generosity. He seems unconcerned with himself and is massively preoccupied instead with the well-being of the young woman. He essentially bankrupts himself as he pays her debts and rescues her from the streets. Yet there seems to be nothing too much for him as he, as he takes her and leads her away from the brokenness of the life that she was living and the hunger that she was experiencing. He, he pours out his love on this young woman. And as he does that, slowly but surely, this woman is transformed. This remarkable thing happens to this woman that she begins to even look loved, even as she is loved. She smiles when she didn't really smile before. She walks down the street with a joy and a confidence that she'd never had before. And amazingly, this makes the man happy too. The two of them pour themselves into one another, into this relationship of love and respect. She is always the rescued and he is always the rescuer, but their lives are intertwined in such a way that their, their joy rises and falls together. Now, let me say to you this morning, whoever you are this morning, whether you're married or single, whether you're a man or a woman, if you're a Christian this morning, then that is your story and you are that woman because Jesus is that young man. Jesus rescues the church from the streets of its sin, gathers the church up to himself. And all the love stories in all the world, all the marriages in all the world, get to point to that greater love story in which we're all caught up. God in Christ reaching down to us and lifting him, lifting us up as he gives himself for us on the cross, working in us the beauty of holiness as his love overflows into our hearts. And let me say, if you're married this morning, you have a glorious opportunity to tell that story with your marriage. And so let me encourage you to tell the story really well, to speak it really clearly because it's the best story the world has ever heard. And let me say if this morning, if you've never heard of that story, if you've never thought that you could be loved like that woman by the Lord Jesus Christ, let me invite you to join in with that story, to be wooed by that young man, this great lover, Jesus Christ, the savior of the church. Let me close in prayer, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us in the Lord Jesus like the best of husbands, that the Lord Jesus gave himself up for us on the cross to make us his bride, his beautiful bride. Thank you that by your spirit, you continue to be at work in us, beautifying us. And we pray, please, that as a church, you might help our relationships with one another to point to this great love story of the Lord Jesus. We want to pray that this morning, especially for the marriages in the room. And we ask, Lord, that you might help us to be godly husbands and wives for the sake of your glory and in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.